Hi, we are ready to start. Hello, everyone. Today we have a very special guest with us, Jonathan, a very dear friend. Jonathan, growing up in Israel, was privy to a very special event that happens in an art every spring. It's the great bird migration. In March, these birds have wintered in Africa and are ready to return to their nesting grounds in Europe and Asia. The river of birds goes thousands of miles over the Sahara, the Red Sea, reaching the end of Israel and then funneled through Elat. They come in millions, wave upon wave of birds that flow endlessly in the sky. This natural wonder is what Jonathan is so passionate about, and he will take us through the journey of the river in the sky. Shaila, will you introduce Jonathan? Ah. So Jonathan uh, Mayrev is one of the most amazing people I have ever met because he actually lives his passion and he has been able to translate his passion and do something truly, truly, truly amazing with it. Um, I think children in Israel are introduced to birds very early. They, um, I saw they have a whole lot of bird ringing stations uh, all spread all over Israel and children sometimes go before school. They will go to the bird ringing uh, stations and volunteer and help over there and be introduced to birds and how to take care of them and how to count them and how to conserve them. And Jonathan as a child uh, was also I think just about 14 years old when he really got into uh, birding in a big way and uh, uh, since then, he's been a champion of births. Um, he's organized uh, this amazing, amazing race for conservation where the entire birding community from all over the world comes as one to save this migration, to save this migration route, as well as to save the birds that are using this life. Because the birds, as they go to different areas, some of them are hunted, some of them are trapped as songbirds, some of them are hunted for the table. And uh, to save these birds, Jonathan and his friends thought of this um, race, this Champions of the Flyway race, in which they raise funds. And every year, they give those funds to a country. I will let Jonathan tell you about this and his amazing, amazing work with the birds. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila, and uh, thank you, Nikhil, for uh, inviting me to participate. Uh, I have a soft spot uh, for India. I think it's an amazing country uh, for wildlife and for birds. And uh, I was fortunate enough to participate in the uh, bird festival in Uttar Pradesh a few years ago. It was a very memorable experience. Um, and as Sheila said, uh, I've been involved with uh, birds ever since I was a child. I'm very fortunate to grow up uh, in a country like Israel, where migration is uh, massive and uh, where uh, the combination of a very small country uh, and a very large range of habitats uh, mean a very large variety of birds. We have uh, just under 550 species of birds that have been documented in Israel. Uh, which is quite remarkable for a country which is so small. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit about the birds themselves of Israel, but uh, the focal point of the talk is uh, this amazing event, the Champions of the Flyway. It's a one-of-a-kind bird race uh, for conservation. So uh, we'll dive right into it. So when you think of Israel, uh, you think of scenes like this, of migration. Uh, here we see a part of a flock of 12,000 uh, white storks that migrated through the Jordan Valley. This is a picture that was taken a few years ago uh, in mid-August. Uh, right now, the storks that have nested in Europe uh, are already starting to make their way south to Africa. And uh, they migrate through Israel in very, very large numbers. Uh, this flock landed uh, in the afternoon in the agricultural fields uh, in the Jordan Valley and uh, basically spent the night there. The next morning when the farmers and tractors returned to the field, uh, I was there to capture them taking off to continue for another day uh, of migration. 
Birds really do uh, fascinate us. Uh, like I said, Israel has uh, a very wide diversity of habitats uh, from uh, snow-peaked mountains in the far north of the country uh, all the way to extreme desert in the south. And all this is within 500 kilometers north to south. Um, the main thing in Israel, about half of the country is desert and various desert habitats. And uh, in the deserts, we can find these remarkable species uh, such as this uh, Arabian green bee eater, uh, which is one of our garden birds in the desert. It's a very common bird, common resident. And uh, I mean, the picture speaks for itself. It's truly a remarkable bird. Another bird uh, which is very common in Israel uh, is the hupo. The hupo uh, was mentioned uh, in the old scriptures as a symbol of wisdom. Uh, they say that King Solomon consulted the hupo uh, when he was thinking about forming an alliance with the Queen of Sheba. And uh, the hupo has great significance uh, within uh, Jewish religion as well. Um, but regardless of religion, it's just a remarkable bird. This particular individual uh, was photographed in a park in the middle of the city of Tel Aviv, and it's actually do, taking a sun bath, uh, spreading its uh, feathers in order to get rid of uh, parasites. Uh, but truly a remarkable bird. Many of you will uh, recognize this sentence, uh, free as a bird. Some of you may recognize this bird as well. Uh, this is a short-toed eagle or a short-toed snake eagle. Uh, it's a summer visitor in, to Israel. It spends the winter months in Africa, and then it migrates back to Israel, arriving around March and uh, breeding in Israel. And uh, around September to October, they migrate back to Africa. Now, when we say uh, free as a bird, this is a saying that is very common with songs, and poems, um, but sadly nowadays um, this statement is just not right anymore because birds are really not free anymore. Birds are suffering immense pressures um, on the breeding grounds from uh, development and loss of habitat and various other factors, uh, agricultural changes, um, Basically, birds need to adapt much quicker than before in order to have a successful breeding cycles. And then on migration, they're hunted, they're killed along the migration corridors. Illegal killing uh, is gonna play a major part in this talk. Um, and then on the wintering grounds in Africa, in our case, birds also suffer uh, various problems, uh, desertification, uh, illegal killing in Africa, uh, various other uh, pressure elements. So birds, sadly, nowadays are just not free anymore. And they have to handle so many man-made problems and man-made obstacles in order to fly safely. This is a Eurasian honey buzzard or European honey buzzard, a very special uh, bird of prey. Uh, you can see that its legs are very weak and you can understand from this that uh, it's not a bird, it's not a powerful raptor that, you know, uses its talons and legs to fiercely hunt prey, but rather this is a very shy forest dwelling bird that uh, its diet consists of flying insects, specifically bees, wild bees and hornets, and they stick their heads into wild beehives in order to eat the honeycomb and to eat the bees and the bee larvae. They have a very special build. They have a very narrow nostril with a nostril flap in order to protect themselves when they stick their heads into these uh, wild beehives. Now, the whole world or nearly the whole world population uh, of European honey buzzards migrates through Israel twice a year. It's quite a remarkable sight. They also begin in mid-August with large numbers uh, arriving in Israel towards the end of the month. Um, and then back again in the spring, and the whole population migrates through in something like 20 days. So days with 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 honey buzzards are not a rare sight uh, during the migration season. And uh, we get 
nearly half a million honey buzzards migrating through Israel every migration season, somewhere between 400 and 500,000 uh, individuals. An interesting thing is that the uh, honey buzzards, uh, here we see a juvenile bird. This is a bird that was maybe three months old. Uh, I photographed it uh, during the fall migration, uh, something in the first days of September a few years ago. And uh, these young birds migrate to Africa and then spend three years in Africa. They don't migrate back before they are adult and ready to breed. So in the fall migration, we see tens of thousands of young birds, but in the spring migration, you don't see any juveniles at all. They all stay in Africa and only migrate back when they're adult. But this particular individual, I was sitting under a tree uh, conducting a migration count, basically counting all the raptors that pass over. And uh, it was still early in the morning. This young bird took off uh, from a roost and drifted slowly towards me, very, very low. This was shot with a 400 millimeter camera. I could barely, <coughs> sorry, I could barely fit uh, this bird into the, into the frame because it was very, very close. It drifted over my head very slowly. I managed to fire something like six shots um, and then it continued on its migration. This is a bird that is young and inexperienced. This means that it doesn't know that humans are dangerous, that humans are, present a danger to migrating honey buzzards. And sadly, in Israel, there is no uh, shooting of raptors. Uh, raptors are protected and there isn't any killing of uh, raptors, but uh, birds that migrate a bit further west from us uh, through the Greek islands or through the Mediterranean basin, sadly uh, find themselves in this situation, here we see a bird of similar, similar age uh, on the Greek island of Zakynthos. This is a bird that was shot uh, by a hunter, illegally killed uh, as it flew low uh, over its head, just like uh, the individual that I showed in the previous slide. This is a turtle dove. And the turtle dove is uh, also mentioned uh, in the Old Testament, if specifically in the Song of Solomon. So the Song of Solomon states that the flowers have appeared in the countryside, the season of singing has come, and the cooing of the dove is heard in our land. This turtle dove was a, sim a symbol of the arrival of spring in the Holy Land, the arrival of spring in Israel. Again, uh, this is a summer visitor. They spend the winter in Africa and then migrate back in the spring. And uh, back in those days, in the days of the Song of Solomon, uh, this was a very, very common bird. It was so common that the cooing of the dove was a recognized uh, song, a recognized call that was a symbol of the arrival of spring. Now, sadly, uh, turtle doves are under immense pressure worldwide and the European breeding populations of turtle doves are crashing. We're talking about an 80% decline in something like 15 years. It's a massive decline. Many of these birds uh, end up uh, illegally killed. In this case, the bird was shot, uh, but not killed, but rather caged and then spent the rest of its life uh, in a cage. It's a horrible story because this is a bird that was once so very, very common and it's now right on the brink of extinction. We need to do something in order to protect this bird. I always say that uh, the turtle dove is the modern day passenger pigeon. Um, German, you're familiar with the passenger pigeon. Uh, you can see uh, the picture here. The passenger pigeon um, was a bird that was endemic to the Americas, to North America specifically. And it was so common that it would uh, flock in flocks of up to one million individuals. And when these birds would arrive uh, on migration, they would fly low and in huge numbers and were hunted by the tens of thousands. Uh, there's all kinds of testimonials and pictures and documentations from the late 1800s uh, in North America, where people would wait for these flocks of passenger pigeons to come and would hunt them mercifully uh, you know, with no mercy, tens of thousands of individuals at a time. Uh, it's mentioned in many places that uh, 
basically the, the passenger pigeon, um, there used to be billions and billions of individuals and it was completely wiped out until it was extinct. The last pass passenger pigeon, and uh, I saw this question, yes, it's a member of, of uh, the dove uh, family as well. Um, the last passenger pigeon uh, passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo in the US in the 1920s. So this is a bird that was completely wiped out uh, from the 1800s until the early 1900s by hunters with very, very primitive means of hunting, stones, sticks, primitive guns. Um, but it's a very, very sad example how us humans can wipe out a species which is super common and from billions to none at all. And I always say that if we're not careful, uh, the turtle dove will be the modern day passenger pigeon. Illegal killing is one of the biggest threats that migrant birds face today. Sadly, this is the situation almost anywhere in the world. Here we can see a redback trike caught uh, on a lime stick. A lime stick is a very common method of illegal killing of birds uh, through the Greek islands, uh, Cyprus, Malta, and various other places along the Mediterranean Sea. It's basically a very thick solution of glue and water that is smeared uh, on the branches the bird lands on the branch, sticks to it, and then is at the mercy of the hunter. It's a very cruel method of hunting, and it's very, very common, sadly. And of course, uh, this redback shrike uh, was released by the person that found them, but still millions and millions of songbirds uh, are caught using these horrible uh, lime sticks. The statistics of the illegal killing in our part of the world uh, are horrifying. I mean, it's a common practice in over 40 countries uh, in the Middle East and Europe. Amazingly enough, uh, this illegal killing is also alive and well in eight members of the EU. The estimation of 35 to 45 million birds are illegally killed every single year in our part of the world. Now the bottom bullet is the most important one, that most of these illegal killers, hunters, trappers, are not bad people. They just don't know any better, and it's a matter of education. Like I said, this is a worldwide problem. Here we see, um, this is a graphic uh, take from the system uh, eBird, from the eBird uh, platform. And uh, these pink dots are basically tens of thousands of observation points of birds under migra on migration. We can see the big migration corridors in the world. You can see uh, the North, North America to South America migration corridor on the left. And then in the middle, uh, our flyway, the Eurasian flyway, birds coming down from Europe and Western Asia, migrating through Israel. Israel is here. Um, my, all these birds migrate down south to Africa and then migrate back. Uh, it's a very, very heavy migration corridor on both sides of the Mediterranean Sea. And you also see your migration corridor here, or some of it anyway. And sadly, this illegal killing of birds happens throughout all these big migration corridors. Uh, the, our uh, Champions of the Flyway focuses on our migration corridor. But sadly, there is illegal killing of birds in South America. Uh, there's horrible numbers of birds being killed in China and other places in Asia. I'm sure it happens in India as well. Sadly, this is still a worldwide problem that needs to be addressed. Like I said, everything starts with education. Uh, you can see this picture here. Ironically enough, this is a picture from a tourism promotion uh, a campaign for the Philippines from a few years ago. This is actually something they take pride in. They plant these pigeons, which by the way, are not even native uh, to the Philippines. And you see these kids with their slingshots uh, walking around and actually promoting uh, this illegal killing of birds. Uh, I'm sure many of you have traveled in other places in Asia and there are places like Thailand or Vietnam where you walk through the forest and it's quiet. You just do not hear any birds. And this is because the illegal killing is rampant and there's hardly any birds left and the ones that are there keep their mouths shut in order not to be killed. 
This beautiful creature is my oldest daughter. Her name is uh, Ofri. Ofri is now 12 years old. This was taken a few years ago when she got her first nice pair of Leica binoculars. Um, and we live in the middle of Israel, right under the migration corridor of storks. And every year, uh, Ofri plays outside in the yard and then uh, her or her uh, sister and brother uh, wait for these flocks of storks. And when they see a flock of storks over the house, they call me, dad, dad, come look at the storks. The storks have arrived and it's a big celebration. We wait for them every fall and every spring and we go outside and enjoy the storks and really celebrate migration. Um, and these are children the same age in Lebanon um, that received their first gun and shot this magnificent black vulture uh, or cenarius vulture and are holding it up as a matter of pride. Uh, the parents uh, of these kids encourage uh, them to go out and shoot these magnificent beasts. And uh, this just highlights what I just mentioned, that education is really the key. Sadly, this illegal trapping and hunting affects all birds, uh, raptors, uh, water birds, uh, everything, storks, pelicans, cranes, of course, all the partridges, quail, chuckers, uh, woodland birds, and even the smallest warblers, bunting, sparrows, all of them are trapped. Sadly, there's a very thriving uh, black market between the Middle East and Southern Europe, where these very, very small songbirds are packed in bags and are sold by the pound. Of course, it's illegal, but sadly, this black market is alive and well. And like I mentioned, the small birds, like warblers and stuff, we're talking about 1 million, 2 million individuals that are hunted every migration season. It's absolutely crazy. Just a quick, uh, th these are pictures that we took from uh, Facebook pages in uh, Lebanon uh, and in uh, other places. And you can see critically endangered species such as sociable lapwings up here, minus their heads. Cranes, I mean, who shoots cranes? Uh, look at this bounty of illegally killed songbirds and bustards. This is something which is absolutely horrible and needs to be addressed. And these are pictures that are posted on Facebook, you know, for the world to see. Look at us, this is what we do. And it's absolutely horrible. It's a big, big issue of tradition uh, versus conservation. I mean, a lot of these hunters have been hunting ever since they were kids. They would accompany, they, were, they would go out with their grandfather uh, with his shotgun, and uh, they don't know that there's anything wrong with what they're doing. That is one of the main reasons that this illegal killing is still going on. Now, of course, this day and age, the information is out there and conservation is more of an important issue. So slowly, slowly, these traditions are stopping but still in many, many places around the world, uh, this illegal killing with many traditional methods is still uh, alive and well. We see two species here, uh, the Eurasian black cap uh, on the top and Ortolan bunting on the bottom. And these are two species uh, which are common. I mean, black caps is one of the more common uh, warbler in Europe. And Ortolan bunting is more of a Southern Europe a songbird, but sadly it's declining in a very, very uh, rapid rate. The reasons that these two specific species are declining are again tradition. Here we see a shot of a, a dish from Cyprus, which is called Ambelopulia. Ambelopulia basically means several birds. And this is a traditional dish of uh, six, seven, eight little warblers which are cooked whole and served with lemon and some uh, okra beans. And this traditional dish is something that you can still find in many tavernas and bars and restaurants in Cyprus and in other places in the Middle East. It's very, very hard for these people which you know, take pride in this tradition uh, to explain to them why it's wrong. And uh, the same goes for the ortolan bunting. The ortolan bunting is considered a delicacy in France and there's some celebrity chefs. It's officially illegal uh, to hunt these ortolan buntings, uh, but still uh, you have all kinds of celebrity chefs 
uh, you know, on TV and stuff, uh, advocating to bring back the ortolan into the menu because it's a dish which is a pride of France. And nowadays it's illegal, but you can go to southern France and go into a restaurant and they will, might be able to serve you ortolan buntings, despite the fact that it's illegal. Again, another example of how tradition gets in the way of conservation. People need to understand that what was good 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, there's bird populations in the world that cannot sustain this anymore. Which brings us to Champions of the Flyway. This is where we come in. Now, I must start with the inspiration of what inspired us uh, to do Champions of the Flyway. Champions, this is a shot from Cape May, uh, New Jersey. Cape May, New Jersey is the stage for the biggest uh, bird race in the world, which is called the World Series of Birding. And uh, you can see the beautiful sand dunes of Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, Cape May sits right on the Delaware Bay along the Atlantic Flyway in the eastern U.S. and it's an amazing migration corridor. And this bird race, uh, the World Series of Birding, has been going on for over 30 years now. And it attracts hundreds of people every year, children, adults, for a big celebration of migration and conservation. And in 2013, uh, I was invited to participate in the World Series of Birding. You can see uh, the closing dinner here, just the number of people that are involved. Um, and you can see my team on the bottom right, the wandering tattlers. Uh, we participated in the race. Now, I must say that that year we didn't really take it too seriously. It was more of a understanding the race, understanding the race rules. And I spent all my time basically consulting uh, with my team members and with staff from New Jersey Audubon uh, to try and understand how we can hold a bird race for conservation in Israel. Now, one of the nice things about the World Series of Birding is that it's a bird race where many, many teams participate, but every team raises money for their specific cause. For example, a youth team from New York raises money for their uh, birding uh, junior bird club. And uh, another team from New Jersey it raises money for wetland preservation, and so on and so forth. Every team basically raises money for a different cause. Overall, a lot of money is raised, but it's spread in many, many uh, different ways. So I spent a lot of time here uh, in New Jersey figuring it out. And uh, basically, once we had everything in place and I sort of understood how we can put together a bird race, we said we have to do one in Israel, because Israel, again, is such an incredible migration corridor. You can see this really schematic uh, uh, model here, where you see birds from the whole Eurasian landmass funneling through a lot on migration and then back again. And we said, if we're going to hold showcase migration somewhere, it has to be uh, in a lot in Israel. And that's exactly uh, what we did. And that's how Champions of the Flyway uh, came to be. In the summer of 2013, my colleague Dan Alon and I uh, visited the UK for the, for the British Bird Fair. And on the way, we stopped by the offices of BirdLife International. And we told them that we want to hold a bird race for conservation in Israel. We said that the concept is that every team that will sign up will raise money for one specific cause and the model will deal with the illegal killing of birds along the flyway. And uh, I must say again that I belong to the Society for Protection of Nature in Israel, and now called uh, BirdLife Israel, and we are a nonprofit uh, environmental NGO. We are the largest environmental NGO uh, in Israel with uh, over 30,000 uh, active members. Uh, and BirdLife Israel is a small branch within SPNI, within the Society for Protection of Nature. So we approached BirdLife and got their blessing. They said that they think it's a crazy idea. They don't know how it will work, but they will help us. And that's how Champions of the Flyway came to be. It really started with a crazy idea in a couple of people's heads, very, very small budget. And the idea was to bring people to Israel to celebrate migration to put together a bird race and to raise money for conservation. The model of champions is pretty simple. 
every year during the summer, we choose a specific conservation cause. And when I say conservation cause, it's usually a country a, or a region that has a specific conservation problem. We will raise, once this, uh, this project is chosen, we choose a capable NGO uh, on the ground, which is someone that will be able to take the money that we raise and actually put it to good use when it comes to tackling the illegal killing of birds. Every team that signs up for the race or registers for Champions of the Flyway starts first raising money and second spreading the word. For example, uh, I'll give you some examples in a second, but the main thing is that all the money that is raised goes to that one active conservation cause or one active uh, conservation action. Champions has become a, a bird race with a difference. Here we see a very nice picture that uh, we shot in the Eilat Mountains, a, an amazing migration a hotspot. And here we see a team from the US, a team from uh, the Netherlands, and a team from South Africa, side by side, all playing together, all sharing observations and enjoying migration together. We feel that uh, as opposed to other bird races around the world, we feel that sharing is caring. I mean, we encourage people to share sightings during the race. In other places, in bird races, the teams are very hush-hush and, and, you know, and, and very, very quiet about the birds that they see. They're not really keen to share information with other teams because you think, you know, I'm not gonna win if I'm gonna give away uh, information. But the fact of the matter is that if you're good enough uh, to win, then you can do it with sharing information because you will also benefit from information shared by other teams. But this is a picture that I really like that really sums up the good energy and the good vibe and the working together uh, on race day in Champions of the Flyway. Every team that signs up for the race gets an online fundraising page. Uh, we use a platform called uh, Just Giving. Here we see uh, one of the all-star teams uh, from the race that happened in March this year, the Women in Step, supported by Kawa, Kawa Optics. And the, you can see that they have a conservation goal. They took a high fundraising goal of $15,000 and they managed to raise even more than that specific goal. Basically, this is a page that the teams circulate around their own crowds telling them, look, we are fundraising for the champions of the flyway because we want to protect migration. And this is circulated around in their crowds and slowly, slowly uh, they gain momentum. The beautiful thing is that um, we don't have, I mean, of course we're happy with sponsors, you know, putting in thousands of dollars uh, of sponsorship, but the fundraising for champions of the flyway is all about spreading the word and getting a, more and more supporters. You can raise money by donating $20 or $50 or $10. A, any small donation counts. And the more people that donate, the more people are connected to the cause. And in this case, you can see that by this time, they had 109 people supporting them, a, raising a, over $15,000 in this case. These are a few more teams a, on our start line. Uh, Champions of the Flyway is a race that goes from midnight to midnight and there's a start line and a finish line. You can see here uh, a small collection of our teams. On the top we see a team from Yorkshire together with the Americans from Cape May. Here on the right we see the Palestine Sunbirders. This is a joint team of Israeli and Palestinian birders competing together. And here we see a team from Wales the Welsh red kites. These images are from the 2018 race, but it's all about, you know, sharing, having fun, high energy, <clears throat> high spirits, and spreading the word and raising money. A few more, again, a couple of teams together up in the Eilat Mountains, the South Africans together with uh, the Yorkshire guys. Here's another team from the UK and from Africa. Uh, all working together, birding together. And here's the team from Zeiss Rock Jumper uh, also participating in the race. So it's really all about friendship and all about the new birding, you know, sharing. 
if you find a good bird, what is the first thing you want to do? Well, besides taking a picture, of course, to document your rare bird, but when you find a good bird, the first thing you want to do is to share the information, to spread the news, so more people can enjoy uh, good birds. And this is the spirit of champions. We have a WhatsApp group where we share sightings, and it's not just bird sightings. You can see, for example, here, <laughs> police trap in a white Toyota on Route 90 South. So you don't just share bird information, but you also share police trap information, or be careful of animals on the road, or other stuff, but you can see here that uh, everyone is sharing and everyone is, you know, really we get seven to 800 messages on this WhatsApp group during race day. It's quite amazing. Our overall cause is to stop the illegal killing of birds and we're gonna do it one place at a time. We started with a project in the Batumi bottleneck in Georgia, the country Georgia. Um, Batumi is a very special area where migration of raptors is a very big deal. Uh, raptors migrate along the Black Sea coast and they funnel through the bottleneck in Batumi where you have the, the Black Sea on one side and the Caucasus mountain range on the other. And these two natural barriers basically form a funnel or a bottleneck where hundreds of thousands of uh, actually more than million birds of prey migrate through. And there used to be a lot of illegal killing of raptors there. And they were the first project that we tackled. The following year, we did a project with bird life in Cyprus, then Greece, then in Turkey. 2017 was a very special year because we did a project, a, an Israeli-based project together with a Muslim country, Turkey in this case. And there was an educational factor to it that we worked with children of Syrian refugees in Turkey. So one thing that we're very, very proud of with Champions of the Flyway is that we don't play political games, that birds know no boundaries and therefore politics do not play a part. In 2018, we was the first time that we took a project with two specific partners, raising money for two partners, Serbia and Croatia, in order to protect a, a specific region along the Adriatic. And the, it was a very, very nice project in 2018, and the two partners uh, worked together after many years that they didn't. 2019 was a special year because it was the first time we left Europe or the Mediterranean and basically took a project in Kenya. We decided to, do, to raise money uh, for the vultures of Kenya. Uh, I'm actually wearing the, the Champions of the Flyway 2019 shirt now. Um, this was basically something that we were asked by BirdLife International. They saw the power of Champions of the Flyway and they said, look, we would like you to raise money for, to protect the vultures in Africa. As you know, the vultures in East Africa are suffering from massive problems, mainly because of poisonings, a bit similar to what happened in India with the vultures uh, years ago. But uh, seven species of vultures in East Africa and Kenya and Tanzania specifically are really, really suffering. And we did a project to raise money to protect the vultures of Kenya. And 2020, uh, which took a very interesting twist uh, with the COVID-19 virus, um, was a country again, was a year again that we raised money for two partners, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, in order to protect the breeding range of steppe eagles. In short, you see every year we choose a specific area and raise for a specific cause. It's important to note again that we don't just raise money, but we also raise awareness. Not many people know about the problems in Greece or in Turkey or in Serbia and Croatia or the vultures in Africa. And every year we try and raise awareness as well as funds because the more people know, the more successful action can be taken to conserve these birds. This is more or less what, do you, what we have achieved uh, money-wise. Uh, you can see it raises nicely. Uh, we raised $50,000 in the first year and we gave another 10,000 to BirdLife in Malta, 60,000 for Cyprus, 67,000 for BirdLife in Greece, 70. In 2018, we raised over $90,000 that was split between both of these Serbia and Croatia partners. 2019, another 80,000 that went to Nature Kenya. 
And 2020, despite not having a race in Israel, we raised over $42,000 uh, for the Step Eagle project. In all, the number is actually a bit higher than that, something like $450,000 for bird conservation worldwide. It's pretty amazing. And again, the money does not stay in Israel. We get our profit, so to speak, from different areas. But all the money that is raised throughout Champions of the Flyway migrates to where it's needed the most. Here are a few examples of the educational projects that were funded by Champions of the Flyway. You can see uh, these children with binoculars are in uh, Georgia, in Batumi. The money that they raised from Champions of the Flyway was implied to a school program with 20 schools in the region. We thought, we think, that it's very smart to use the children to get to their parents. Because if we teach children about birds, they will then go home and tell their father or their grandfather, why are you going to kill these birds? It's wrong. Why do you have dead birds in the freezer? And so on and so forth. And basically through the children reach the hunting uh, community. In Greece, uh, the Money from Champions funded a very, very nice um, art contest where 300 children uh, basically drew birds. And through this, they learned about birds and bird conservation. It's uh, the educational element, as you know throughout this talk, is very, very important when it comes to Champions of the Flyway. Other things that we have achieved. The main thing is the, this worldwide exposure of the threats that birds face on migration. Like I said, every year, specific project and every specific project we shine a light on these issues. We also prove that birding and open spaces are viable tourism anchors. You know, decision makers, governments and municipalities and state governments like in India, they think that the way to become modern and the way to become, the way for development is to build, build, build new shopping malls, new neighborhoods, more artificial structures, more man-made structures. They need to understand that birding and open spaces and nature tourism are, a much, are more and more important. We see this now with urban nature, it, that decision makers are understanding the importance of green spaces within cities, parks, and more uh, open space. And the beautiful thing is that it doesn't cost money. Instead of investing millions to build a water park or to build a, a, a new shopping mall, millions or tens of millions of dollars, all you need to do is to spend a little bit of money and to arrange a reserve or to protect a natural area. And these attract tourism. In the world now, there's over 100 million people that do ecotourism, that travel around the world in order to enjoy nature. 100 million people. This is a massive market. And these are usually tourists that leave good money. So Champions of the Flyway has proved to decision makers in Israel that we should put money into birding and into nature reserves because it's a strong tourism anchor. We're very proud to say that we've inspired similar projects around the world. There's a bird race now in Tessel in the Netherlands, which is built on the structure of Champions of the Flyway. We're trying to do something in China as well basically a bird race for conservation. It's something that we're very, very proud. And we have received, this is our big profit from holding Champions of the Flyway in Israel, is that Israel and Eilat specifically are being recognized as one of the best places in the world to experience the early spring migration. I think that during the month of uh, March, Eilat is probably one of the best places in the world uh, to enjoy migration. Some of you have been there and can, uh, you know, have witnessed it uh, firsthand. We have created a real flyway family. People that have participated in Champions over the years have become a strong, tight-knit international community that gets things done. People that participated in races have gone on to work together on various different things uh, around the world. We create a serious buzz every year. No politics cross-border cooperation, and an example of this new birding, sharing and breaking barriers. We can see on the picture on the left, we see a team from the Netherlands together with a team from Turkey. Around that time, there was serious conflict between the countries. 
And again, on the right, we see the Palestine sunbirders, uh, Noam Weiss in the center, the director, the Israeli director of uh, the Eilat Birding Center, together with three colleagues from BirdLife Palestine, uh, Palestinian birders working together with Israeli birders, and they did very, very well, coming in second place. So on the ground, there is no place for politics. Something we're very, very proud of is the Israeli factor. Uh, we have children in Israel that have participated in Champions of the Flyway ever since they were six. Now they are 12, 13 years old, but they have a very, very strong conservation element now. Like I said, I started birding when I was very young, but when I was birding, um, I just enjoyed the birds. You know, I would see birds and, and really enjoy them and, and observe them and learn, but I never really gave it another thought about the conservation. Now, children that are birding in Israel, they go out and they see turtle doves, for example, and they know the story behind the turtle doves. They know the conservation problems. They know the, the dangers that these species face. It adds that extra heart element to your everyday birding. There's a story behind every bird, and we need to connect to these birds, and we need to do whatever we can to protect them. It's really, really amazing, and it fuels the conservation passion. A child of 10 years old or 11 years old that understands conservation through this bird that they are seeing will forever be connected to birds and will forever thrive, you know, to, to conserve these birds and to do what they can in order to protect them. A few more little victories. Uh, we see now a significant improvement in Batumi, where the project was first uh, in 2014. Uh, we see that there's a significant number, a uh, drop in the numbers of birds being shot. They have received very good media coverage and even won the Whitley Award uh, for bird conservation in Georgia. In Greece, we've done good progress. Uh, there's a lot more enforcement of illegal killing of birds. New laws have been put into place. The punishments have been uh, raised. Uh, for poaching, and very, very important is that the Athens municipality has now passed law that they ban the cage bird trade. Cage birds are a big thing in Greece, and in the past you would go into a pet shop anywhere in Athens and find wild birds in cages, birds that were illegally uh, trapped. And nowadays it's illegal to sell these wild birds uh, in the municipality of Athens. Serbia and Croatia, our 2019 project, our 2018 project, they work together, these two countries, for the first time in 20 years. They have a bitter history between them. Um, and because of Champions of the Flyway, the partners worked together. And in 2019, they held a record number of poaching arrests and persecutions, which is pretty awesome. 2020 was the year of the steppe eagle. Steppe eagle is a bird that you know also uh, from India. Some of them uh, winter uh, in India. Nearly the whole world population of steppe eagles nests in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and they nest on the ground. They nest in the Asian steppe. These are massive, massive, massive open areas, plains, and uh, there's no trees or no high places for these magnificent eagles uh, to nest. So they just build a nest on the ground or sometimes on very, very low sandy hills or mounds and raise their chicks on the ground. And because of this, uh, they suffer from two major problems. One is electrocutions. Uh, these low flying birds nesting on the ground pass low and hit power lines. Sometimes they get electrocuted, in other cases, just the impact of hitting the power lines uh, kills these birds. And also, step fires. That's a very big problem. Uh, there's places in Kazakhstan where local people basically set fire uh, to the plains in order to clear areas for agriculture. And when they set these fires, these ground nesting eagles sadly uh, pay a price. So in late 2019, we teamed up with BirdLife Kazakhstan in order to raise money for steppe eagles. Here we see an example, a sad example of these low flying uh, implications when a bird basically hit this power line. So 
So we've started our fundraising campaign in uh, December 2019 and it went well. And then we still thought that we're going to hold our annual bird race in a lot in March. And then, as you know, come March 2020 and the whole world goes upside down with uh, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus. In January, we understood that it's going to be very difficult for the international teams to arrive. In February, we understood that it's going to be very difficult to hold a race at all. And in March, we understood that there isn't going to be any actual race in Eilat because the country was in lockdown and people could not travel. So we had to adapt. The easiest thing to do was to cancel the race, was to say, okay, we're taking a one-year break. March 2020, we will not be able to hold champions of the flyway. But we decided not to choose the easy solution, but to try something else. And we came up with the idea of an international day of solidarity. During that time, late March, was when the first wave of COVID-19 was going crazy all over the world. This was the time where places like Italy and Spain were slowly, you know, their numbers were skyrocketing and a very, very strict lockdowns uh, everywhere in Europe and in other places. So people could not really travel. And we said, okay, we're going to ask people to go birding where they can and how they can. Everyone will go out on March 31st on race day. If they can wander around and go birding somewhere locally, that's fine. If they can look out their window or bird from their gardens, that's fine as well. And we encouraged people worldwide, the Flyway Champions family and others to go birding on March 31st and to submit their sightings uh, together. We published it on the Champions of the Flyway website. We said, thinking of forming a solidarity team, three simple steps, form a virtual team, spread the message, I'm going to go birding on race day 2020 to help save uh, step eagles and do some birding. And of course we had to put in, please be responsible and follow local COVID-19 guidelines. If you can't get out to your patch, birding from your garden or window is great. And this caused great momentum worldwide. Here's a small list uh, of over 30, well, we had around 32 or 33 countries, birders from 33 countries around the world that went birding. And these are the number of species that were documented on March 31st during our Champions of the Flyaway Day of uh, Solidarity. We were very excited, even in Italy, a birder friends from Italy. And remember this time in Italy, Italy was burning. I mean, Northern Italy, the situation was horrible. And yet these people were able to go out and find some peace and solitude and get their minds off COVID-19 and all pull together worldwide in solidarity and enjoy birds and migration. This is a list of places where people were birding. Uh, sadly, there's a little gap in India. Hopefully next year this will change. Um, this is a, uh, a partial uh, list. Overall, we had 1,154 species that were seen uh, on March 31st from birders from 32 countries. Over 400 birders uh, participated and submitted sightings. And this is uh, more than 10% of the world's birds seen on that one single day of solidarity worldwide. But the big thing is that despite COVID-19 and the economic crisis and the fact that people cannot, you know, their minds were somewhere else, we still managed to raise over $42,000 for Step Eagle conservation, even without holding a physical race in Israel. And this was a big victory. We went from a humble beginning in 2014. You can see not many participants into 2019, where we had 32 teams and 180 birders participating in Champions of the Flyway. Now here's something that is a food for thought for my friends in India. This is something that I spoke with uh, Nikhil uh, about a few times. We think that there's place to do something similar like Champions of the Flyway in India. In this picture, we see, of course, the iconic a great Indian bustard, which sadly, uh, the situation is not, not, not looking good. Uh, but this is just an example of a conservation cause. 
You can do a bird race, you know, the Delhi Bird Foundation and other places, other chapters around India, many active birders and photographers in India. You can hold a race for conservation in your home. You choose a conservation cause, for example, all the money that you raise will go to protection of the great Indian bustard or to protect a specific reserve or wetland or choose a different cause. But basically, you can take uh, the model of Champions of the Flyway and do something similar in India. And if anybody wants to do it, Nikhil, anyone else that wants to help, I will be more than happy to donate my time and to help you uh, put this thing together and make it a success story uh, in India. Because together we can all make a change. And because they deserve to migrate in peace, these amazing birds, that cannot speak out for themselves and we have to speak out for them. And I thank you and I wish good health to all. Namaste. Thank you, Jonathan. That was really inspiring. And right now we're all charged up and we will do a champion for India. We will do, we will do, do that. Uh, Kavi, will you put up a slide now? Yes, sure. Give me a second. Nice to see Aditi and Sanjay. How are you? <laughs> okay, so like most of you know, uh, one of our partners for these talks is Sanctuary Nature Foundation. And as part of this partnership, all the viewers of the Delhi Bird Talks get a one year free digital subscription to Sanctuary Asia magazine or Sanctuary Asia Cub magazine, which is for kids. Uh, in order to avail your free copy, just go to the Delhi Bird Foundation website, www.delibirdfoundation.org slash offers, and you can just put in your details there and receive your free digital subscription for a year. Another partner for our talks is Zayas. And as part of this, we ask one question of the day and one person who answers it correctly gets an opportunity to win either a Zayas binocular harness or a Zayas cleaning kit. You can submit your answers again on the Delhi Bird Foundation website. The link is shown on the screen. You can take a photograph of this. Jonathan, would you like to ask all the viewers who are tuned in today the question of the day? Yes, uh, I was asked to put together a question and I think this is an interesting one. So which bird of prey nests in Israel? It's a summer visitor to Israel, but the whole world population of this bird Winters on one island of Africa. We'll that also put, <laughs> yeah, we'll put this question up on the Delhi Bird Foundation page and the Delhi Bird Foundation uh, Facebook group as well, in case you'd like to refer to it later. Uh, the chat box has been opened. In case you have any questions for Jonathan, you can start writing them in and I'll ask them as and when we receive those questions. So Jonathan, the first question that we've coming in is from Jayantika, who's asking in which month does Champions of the Flyway take place? Uh, I think you mentioned March, but could you also give some details on how people can participate, how they can form a team and, and how, how to just get involved in the whole process? Sure. So uh, Champions of the Flyway always happens in the third week of March. That is the peak migration time in Israel. It's when you have the largest chance for the highest number of species and also for migration spectacles, large numbers of birds. So it always take, takes place in the last week uh, of March. I must say that in 2021, uh, we're most likely not gonna hold it in the spring because as you know, no one really knows what the situation will be uh, in uh, March in early 2021 and because uh, the race is just the climax of several months of fundraising. We are actually thinking of moving it to the fall of 2021. You will hear news about this. Uh, you can follow Champions of the Flyway on Facebook. Uh, you can uh, Google it uh, and look at our project web website. And basically... Um, Here's what I found. Sorry. Basically, anyone can join Champions of the Flyway. Um, I know that uh, Nick and uh, Sanjay uh, visited Israel and uh, joined. Uh, 
you form a team of uh, three birders or more, and uh, you sign up for the race, you start raising money, and uh, you come and participate in the race uh, in Israel. And all the information is on championsoftheflyway.com. Great, yes, for the benefit of the viewers, I think when Nick Sanjay Shaila also went for the Champions of the Flyway, uh, I think Shaila has written a trip report. We can post the link of that on the Delhi Bird page as well. So in case anybody would like to go and read that trip report. Uh, we've got another question coming in about have birds started altering their migration routes due to human interference? This is something that is uh, scientists are working on uh, now. I mean, it's, it, it takes time, uh, but we do see that some birds are already uh, learning, especially around the Mediterranean basin, places like Malta, Cyprus, Greece, where there is a still hunting of birds of prey, for example, and storks, soaring birds mainly. And we see that birds are now changing slowly, altering migration routes. But this is something that takes time. And of course, it takes one generation to do it. And then it's slowly uh, passed down genetically. But we are seeing, so the short answer is yes. Um, but the, the answer is more complicated than that. It takes time, but we do see that soaring birds are slowly changing uh, their migration routes. Mm -hmm. Great. I don't think we have uh, any more questions coming in. Nick, is there anything you'd like to mention or should we close? Thanks, Jonathan. That was really inspiring. And I'm sure a lot of us are inspired now to start the champions for the, for the Indian project. And thank you everyone for joining in and see you next weekend. Next weekend, we have a fantastic talk by Raju Kasambe on the secret lives of hornbills. So see you next Sunday and thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for having me and uh, I hope to see you sooner than later and be well. 20, 2021 champions. I wish. <laughs> See you there. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.